Hello everyone! In this session, part 6 of the series all about e-bikes, I'll be talking about electric bike brakes, handlebars, and suspension systems, and what you should consider before buying an electric bike. The show will start right after this. If you remember, in part 1, we talked about the three ways an e-bike can move. Now it's time to see how it stops. The bicycle's brakes. First, how the brakes are activated. Instead of a brake pedal like in a car, we know that the brakes on a bicycle, electric or non-electric, are operated by squeezing a pair of levers attached to the handle grips. The rear brake is activated by the right lever and the front brake by the left lever. It's that way for all bicycles, well in North America that is. I should mention that on an electric bike, the action of squeezing the brake levers on either side activates a switch that turns the motor off. Obviously, this is a necessary safety device to prevent the bike from running off on the rider. As for how the brakes make the wheels stop turning, the most commonly used stopping mechanism on electric bikes is the disc brake, a thin perforated metal disc that's mounted to the hub of each wheel. A caliper houses a pair of flat brake pads made of a material that's highly resistant to heat. This squeezes the two sides of the disc, providing very effective braking. They provide great stopping power even in wet weather. There are different sizes of discs ranging from 150 mm to 203 mm in diameter. The larger ones are mainly found on mountain bikes, and the smaller ones are adequate for most uses. You will sometimes find an electric bike with rim brakes, the kind that are still common on non-electric bicycles. They consist of a caliper that squeezes a pair of rubberized pads against the two sides of the rim of each wheel. They are less expensive than disc brakes, but also less effective. They lose a lot of their stopping power when they get wet, they are prone to clogging with mud and snow, and they require frequent adjustments. Because of these reasons, and because e-bikes are heavier than non-electric ones, rim brakes are not very commonly used on electric bikes. On the other hand, this type of brake is easier to understand and to adjust than disc brakes. There is another kind of braking system in the world of electric bikes that's very rare. I'm referring to drum brakes, like on the older cars. The only e-bikes that I know that have this braking system are actually electric recumbent trikes, the Azub and the Ice. There is an old bicycle braking system that doesn't exist on any electric bike. I'm referring to the old coaster brakes we used to have on our childhood bicycle. The reason they're not used, I suppose, is because it's not possible to provide them with a motor cutoff switch. Something has to link the brake lever to the caliper that squeezes the pads. There are two different mechanisms for this, mechanical and hydraulic. The least expensive and the most common type is a simple twisted steel wire that runs through a stiff sheath in the form of a long stiff tube. These cables are inexpensive and relatively easy to replace when they're worn out. The main drawback is that they tend to stretch over time and require occasional adjusting. Because of their extensible nature, riders describe them as feeling a little spongy when they pull on the brake levers. The other way of linking the brake lever to the brake pads is an oil-filled hydraulic system. Because the oil doesn't compress, hydraulic brakes provide the rider with a firm feel when he or she pulls on the brake levers and very effective stopping power. The only maintenance they need is a rare oil change. The disadvantages are that they're much more expensive than cable brakes and when they do need servicing they require specialized knowledge. From my own experience, though, I rode my cube with hydraulic brakes 13,000 kilometers and never had to service the hydraulic system. 
Before going on to the next subject, I'll just mention that there exists a superior braking system that consists of four-piston brakes instead of the standard two-piston ones. These apply more pressure on the brake pads, the brake pads are oversized, and the discs are also bigger. They would be suitable for an aggressive mountain biker, or a traveler who tows a very heavy camper, or a very oversized person, or someone who lives in the mountains. The equivalent to the car's steering wheel for the electric bike, of course, is the handlebar. I've observed that there are basically three classes of handlebars, and the choice will depend on the kind of cycling you do and your physical condition. Straight handlebars. These wide handlebars are found mainly on mountain bikes. They allow the rider to make fast, accurate moves on narrow trails with lots of obstacles and curves. The larger distance between the hands provides leverage to overcome the wheel grabbing forces created by the surface obstacles on the trail. The position of the hands forces the elbows out, opening up the chest which is good for aggressive riding, but they wouldn't be comfortable for touring for a day-long ride. Another type of handlebar, a very different one, is the curved handlebar, or the swept-back handlebar. This is a typical Dutch bicycle. It has the type of handlebar that you would want if you prefer to be comfortably seated upright. The position of the hands reduces strain on the wrists, they're ideal for those who have back and neck issues. Upright seating allows the rider a better vision of the road and traffic than drop handlebars. Another safety aspect is that the upright position makes the rider more visible to automobile drivers. There are different degrees of sweep, and the choice is a matter of taste. Drop handlebars. This sporty-looking handlebar is found on road bikes and racing bikes. The drop handlebar pulls the arms and shoulders inward, creating better drag coefficient, putting the rider in a more aerodynamic position in order to maximize speed. Moreover, the bent position lowers the center of gravity and therefore allows better balance. Because the bent position is uncomfortable, the rider will often hold the top part of the handlebar when he or she needs a rest. Another downside is that the rider's view of the surrounding traffic is more limited. There are also adjustable handlebars like those found on the Pedego City commuter. The key to their operation is the stem, which is fully adjustable without the need of any tools. They're useful for a bike shared by several people or if you like to change position during the day's bicycle touring. Limiting yourself to three handlebar styles is perhaps a bit too simplistic. As you can see from this photo, there's a wide variety of shapes. The shape of the handlebar will be the main factor that will decide what will be your seating position. But if you need your handlebar to be positioned higher or further back to allow you to sit more upright, you can ask your bike dealer to install a stem riser. The stem is the part that holds the handlebar in place. Some stems are adjustable to allow you to vary its angle with a few turns of an Allen wrench. And if the e-bike you'd love to buy doesn't have the right kind of handlebar, you could buy the one that will fit perfectly for your needs for about $40. Before moving on to the next topic of this episode, let's have a look at what's at the ends of the handlebar, the hand grips. When I was a kid, handle grips were cylindrical in shape and were made of hard rubber and were hard on the hands. Nowadays, we can enjoy improvements in design and materials. Mountain bike riders with their straight handlebars and peloton riders with their drop handlebars seem to prefer cylindrical hand grips. They can choose among a wide range of high-tech materials for optimal maneuverability and comfort. Most electric bikes on the market have adopted ergonomic grips with an enlarged wing at the outer tip. This innovation disperses pressure on your palm and prevents bending the wrist and constricting the nerves. My Pedego City commuter came with cylindrical leather grips. 
For me, leather is less slippery when the hands are sweaty, and it has a comfortable feel and has beautiful looks. While on the subject of handlebars, if you live in a northern climate, you will be riding in very cold weather. A nice addition to wearing gloves or mittens is a pair of handlebar mitts. You'd be surprised, but when your hands are tucked into these windproof insulated enclosures, you can do with lighter gloves or no gloves at all, depending on the temperature. If you'd like to install a pair on your e-bike, you might like to watch my video, Keep Your Hands Warm with Handlebar Mitts, linked in the description. Now for the final subject of this session, suspension systems. Unlike cars, most e-bikes don't come with any form of suspension to absorb the shocks from potholes, ruts, uneven pavement, and bumps. Most e-bikes' frames are stiff and offer no absorption of road shocks. The advantages of this type of frame are that they're slightly lighter, slightly less expensive, and slightly less complicated than e-bikes that have a suspension system of some kind or other. A lot of e-bikes on the market have a suspension system in the fork. On most of these, the firmness of the suspension can be adjusted to provide more or less absorption of road shocks, or it can be locked to remove the effect completely. I've owned e-bikes without any suspension and one with a suspension fork, and for my part, for riding on city streets, dirt roads, unpaved trails, a suspension fork is a big advantage worth the extra cost and weight. If the e-bike you fell in love with doesn't have a front suspension, it might be possible to have a replacement aftermarket suspension fork installed on it. However, many e-bikes that have a die-cast aluminum frame cannot be modified in this way. A full suspension bike is one that has a suspension system in the rear wheel as well as the front one. These are prized mostly by mountain bikers. The disadvantages are that they add extra weight to the bike, they give you one more thing that can fail, and if what you need is a step-through frame, the choice is very limited. The only one I know of is the Frey Savannah, a powerful beast equipped with a powerful motor. I can just imagine it would be nice to ride in the spring on Gatineau streets when they're strewn with freshly grown potholes. If the e-bike of your choice doesn't have a suspension system in the frame, there is a solution that can be adapted to any bike, seat post suspension. There are two suspension seat post systems. There's the simple inexpensive spring inside the seat post, as in this photo. But the much superior mechanism is the articulated suspension system, as seen here. Here is a live demonstration of how it works. There are several brands that use the same principle. The Thudbuster, Shockstop, Connect, or DMN are just a few examples. An additional measure of comfort can be achieved by selecting the most comfortable seat. Some seats depend on springs or the amount and type of padding to absorb shocks. For an upright sitting position, a wide soft seat is preferable. The shape of the seat depends on the rider's position. For a leaning position, such as on a road bike, a narrow saddle is necessary, even if terribly uncomfortable. That's the end of part 6. Join me again for part 7, the final session of all about e-bikes. Here we'll talk about the bewildering variety of styles of electric bikes, how different types of frames can influence your choice of an e-bike, accessories that you can get, where to buy your e-bike, ideas about safety, and my closing thoughts. Don't miss this. Thank you for your attention, and remember, never quit cycling.